On the 16th of November last year, the New York Post ran an article way, way back on page 26. A sort of positioning where you place the type of news that barely qualifies as news. Florida man makes announcement, said the headline. The Florida man, of course, was former President Donald J. Trump. And the announcement was that he intended to make another run at the presidency of the United States in 2024. The open mockery that headline represented, coming from a newspaper of Republican right, by the way, was taken as reflecting just how far Trump's star had fallen during the recent months. Whereas he'd launched his very first election campaign with impeccable style and bravado, this one was held to have been something of a joke. The chintzy room where he made his announcement was filled with QAnon truvers, Holocaust deniers and various other characters who were there apparently because nobody else, certainly nobody of any reputation, would agree to fill up the vacant spaces. Trump had been widely blamed for the poor performance of his chosen candidates in the midterm elections. And he looked deflated, off his game, a shadow of his former self. The world, it was said, and the Republican Party as well, was ready for the post-Trump era. Well, what a difference a few months makes in politics. Now, former President Trump is at the absolute centre of the new cycle again and doing what he always did best, sucking the oxygen out of any room where his opponents are gathered. Nobody is quite sure if the current process is going to see him end up in jail or end up in the White House. Such is the peculiar, unanchored times that we live in Either seems equally likely, and both at the same time doesn't seem out of the question. Headline writers have been making a meal of the historical line that has been crossed here, whilst rarely reflecting on the fact that you can read that in one of two ways. On the one hand, yes, you have the narrative that says, here you have a remarkably bad and norm-breaking president. And the evidence of his remarkable badness is that he was the first to be impeached twice. And now he is the first to be arrested and criminally prosecuted. But of course, you can take it with a very different spin. That which says the Democrats have become so remarkably bad and norm-breaking. They have routinely used mechanisms of last resort in their obsession with bringing down their enemies and achieving their goals. In this telling, the double impeachments and the criminal court case are badges of shame, yes, but badges of shame for those who have used those devices for nakedly political ends. There is enough truth to both of these versions to allow America's political classes to do what they now love to do most, talking straight past each other but whilst on a downward spiral of mutual demonisation. It's certainly true that Donald Trump brought a coarsening of American political life and significant norm-breaking. In the 2016 election that took him to power, he first declared himself as someone who would accept fraud as being the only explanation as to why he could ever lose an election. Bear in mind, right up until the last results came in, he, along with everyone else, rather expected that he was about to lose that election. When you attack the integrity of democracy itself, rather than the performance and the suitability of your opponent, you are playing with fire. And he did that first. And it's interesting to note as well, for when anti-Trump protesters this week carried signs that said, lock him up, they were, we all understood, references to Trump's original norm-breaking attacks on Hillary Clinton, where he got his supporters to chant, lock her up, a reference to her legal problems over how she mishandled confidential emails. 
But while the threat was norm-breaking, it wasn't real. The moment Trump was elected, in the face of some of his supporters who were eager to see it fulfilled, he dismissed it with a laugh and a wave of the hand. That plays great before the election. No, we don't care. The campaign had a lot of bluff and bluster, the sort of robust and not always clean rhetoric that has been a part of American elections since the day when George Washington first stepped down calling for Clinton to be locked up, had been just that, norm-breaking for sure, but still bluff and bluster. Trump crossed a number of lines during his presidency. Jailing his political opponents wasn't one of them. The problem for the other side was that they could not bring themselves to analyse clearly just what this thing was that had entered the White House. They felt too affronted, too traumatised at what had happened. And therefore they were so clear that this was the lowest brute, someone for whom law-breaking was as natural as breathing, that it was surely just a matter of time before they could catch him out on a point of substance and then see him hauled out of office in ignominy. The fact this week that less serious commentators have been rather fixated on the question of whether Trump would be put into handcuffs, whether a mugshot photo of him would be released. These were all testament to how this fantasy had been layered up over the years. The problem for the Democrats is that their impatience, their single-minded determination, meant that they pursued vehicles that ultimately did not prove to have the substance that they wished that they did. But instead, they did give the impression of a witch hunt. The first Trump impeachment, for instance, based on the absolute certainty they shared that there must have been collusion between the Trump campaign and Putin's Russia. It was the only thing, surely, that could explain how he got elected. Except that after the inquiry had run its course, it became clear that the evidence just wasn't there. And now there's this criminal indictment. And again, you have the headline writers saying things like America's disgrace, first president to be criminally indicted. Top Democrat Nancy Pelosi said that Trump would have his day in court where he would be able to try to prove his innocence, which for a number of others was rather a telling comment because technically, of course, it's supposed to be the other way round. Everyone is considered innocent until proven guilty. Was it just a slip of a tongue? Or was it a reveal of the real mindset that now governs politics? President Trump is guilty until proven innocent. Obviously, Republicans argued the latter. And part of why this process has become so incendiary is because it's become clear to everyone, including many people who don't like Trump at all and do not wish him well, that this really does fit the definition of a political witch hunt. The case against Trump, brought by the Manhattan District Attorney, is made up of 34 alleged felonies. They are considered by many legal observers to be extremely weak, as they take offences that would be misdemeanours in any other context, save that someone has worked extremely hard to come up with novel arguments as to why they should be upgraded. There's a reasonable chance they could be thrown out as having no solid legal basis at all. However, if they're not, Trump standing with the citizens of Manhattan is sufficiently poor that you could imagine a jury there finding him guilty of pretty much anything put to them. In the meantime, the appearance of a political witch hunt has pushed Trump's support amongst his Republican base sky high. From that sad, deflated announcement of some months ago, he is now absolute front and centre and by far the most likely to emerge from the primaries as the candidate for president. Page 26 no longer. Whether this is a feature or a bug depends on who you ask. For some, it's Trump's resilience blowing up in the faces of those who want to use the law to keep him off the ballot. But for some Democrats, this is part of what they hold to be a politically shrewd calculation. The reasoning goes something like this. An effective campaigner and governor, 
such as, for example, Ron DeSantis, will be far harder to beat following a period where the sitting president has at times plumbed depths of unpopularity. But if Democrats can elevate Trump, via the criminal prosecutions, meaning that he gets the nomination as candidate, he will be much easier to beat. There is some evidence to support this proposition. Republican supporters are much more likely to support the candidate they see the other side as subjecting to a witch hunt. However, centre-ground independents, the people whose support you need to win an actual presidential election rather than just for primaries, those people have largely soured on Trump. They are just exhausted by it. And they are generally confirmed in that by the criminal charges, not the opposite. Well, that's for theory anyway, because you can find polls that suggest Trump could potentially still win against a Biden candidacy and even more likely win against a Kamala Harris one. A recent Harris poll gave Trump 45% versus 41% for Biden, and that wasn't especially an outlier. Now, there's still a long time to go. Polls are unreliable. So yes, if you're looking for pure party advantage, the Democrats may be as successful in this as they were similarly elevating some of the most extreme election-denying Trump-supporting candidates in the midterm elections, who did indeed mostly then go on to lose the election. Those are results from actual elections, not opinion polls. But at some point, people have to start asking, at what price? Because in politics, you can guarantee one thing. Once one side breaks the norms, the others will quickly follow. Presidents using the law to jail their political opponents is behaviour we tend to associate with banana republics. But now we have this case brought widely seen as weak because politics has become so polarised, some people just can't help themselves, but take whatever opportunity they see right in front of their eyes. Trump supporters chanted, lock her up, and he didn't. But after this, all bets are surely off. Now, that's all very well some on the Democrat side are saying, but what this really is about is that no man is above the law. And that's a basic principle we should celebrate. It's one of those obvious statements of principle that can sort of be applied to any scenario, however poorly it seems to fit. Because indeed, that no man is above the law is an honourable and valuable principle. It's a principle the United States has demonstrated before in relation to its president specifically. Almost 150 years ago, in fact, President Ulysses S. Grant was stopped by police for speeding in his horse and buggy. He was placed under arrest by Officer West, who, in a poignant twist of his post-Civil War tale, was one of two black police officers in Washington, D.C., and a former slave. According to the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial Fund, Officer West said, I am very sorry, Mr. President, to have to do it, for you are the chief of the nation, and I am nothing but a policeman. But duty is duty, sir, and I will have to place you under arrest. The president was released on $20 bail. It's a story that is at the same time astonishing and to the undoubted credit of the United States of America. To a former slave, freedom meant that everyone, and that means everyone, is held to the same rules. A precious thing in the world as we know it, where the opposite is far more often the norm. But is that really what we're dealing with here? Many have observed that were Donald Trump not exactly who he is, he would probably not be facing these charges right now. It's the very opposite of the observation that everyone gets treated the same in the face of the law. They observed that President Obama's campaign was caught with campaign reporting violations. In other words, related to what Trump is accused of here. Somewhat less colourful, to be fair. No former porn stars involved. 
Nevertheless, his campaign was fined by the Federal Election Commission. George W. Bush supporters likewise violated campaign finance laws. They were fined by the Federal Election Commission. Nobody's above the law has been shown over and over, but only in this case has the law been so striking in its pursuit of the man rather than a specific crime. I've said before that whatever a modern civil war would look like, it may or may not involve armies fighting in the streets, America feels like it's poised on the edge of finding out. Those Democrats who think this is a remarkably shrewd political plan, do they quite realise the fire that they're playing with? You take a polarised, incendiary situation, you then go out of your way to promote into the position of opponent candidate the one person who is guaranteed to question the validity of any election that goes against him. You then validate that impression amongst the minds of his supporters by demonstrably targeting that individual with an unfair legal witch hunt. And you do that because you think it will win you the next election. It's almost as though it hadn't crossed your mind that the consequences of that win might turn out to be a lot worse than the consequences of an actual loss that you might win control of the ship of state by sinking it first, that a candidate might prefer an opponent whose loss will undermine the foundations of democracy rather than an opponent who will join them in supporting the peaceful transfer of power, simply because of party advantage, that is a candidate who has lost their anchor in the integrity of the system. Like most other observers from outside the country, and a fair few from within it, I dare say, I'm left looking at the prospect of Joe Biden versus Donald Trump in 2024 and asking once again, is this really the best that this great nation can muster? But it's not that way by accident. Who you choose to represent your country comes down to what question you think you're trying to answer. Right now... That question seems to be, shall we fight? Shall we just stop pretending we have anything left in common that unites us as America and instead just fight, maybe even to the death? Well, surely there are better questions to answer than that.